Hello, my name is Carlos Lifchitz. I'm a former associate professor at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, in the United States. And currently, I'm a consultant pediatric gastroenterology at the Italian Hospital, Buenos Aires, Argentina. I thank you very much for inviting me to be a speaker at this meeting. It is very unfortunate that I will not be able to be present, of course. I have been to Iran several times and I enjoy all the beauties and the hospitality. This time, unfortunately, we will have just a video recording. I will be talking about the importance of complementary feeding and supplemental complementary feeding. When you walk uh, in London, you can see that some streets have unusual names, and this is Milk Street. And I thought it would be appropriate to bring it as a picture of it today, since we're going to be talking in the beginning just briefly about milk. Because what is the, uh, the timing of introduction of complementary foods? The WHO recommends that exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months, following by the introduction of complementary feeding alongside breastfeeding. This recommendation has been based on a consideration of the optimal direction, duration of exclusive breastfeeding. And since the infant formula is defined by WHO as complementary feeding, there are no recommendations as to whether uh, the, when the complementary feedings should be introduced in babies who unfortunately cannot be breastfed and are formula fed. What it is among many, many benefits of uh, exclusive breastfeeding, which I'm not gonna to mention today, it is known that there are no deficits in growth nor effects of any type uh, within six months of exclusive breastfeeding. It is not possible to rule out that exclusive breastfeeding without iron supplementation through six months may compromise hematologic status in vulnerable infants. And we will discuss that a little bit later. There is reduced risk of one or more episodes of gastrointestinal infection within six months of exclusive breastfeeding versus three months of exclusive breastfeedings. But this has been shown particularly for uh, income, uh, high income uh, countries. Now, is it harmful to continue with just cow's milk and not introduce complementary feedings? Because as a matter of fact, cow's milk, and for that matter, infant formula, which is modified cow's milk. Cow's milk is a complete source of energy made up of all the major macronutrients and partly of some micronutrients, particularly calcium and phosphorus. On a comparative basis with beef, meat, eggs, whole cow's milk is the richest source of calcium and vitamin D and the cheapest source of protein, calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D. So why no cow's milk for babies below one year of age? Well, there are striking differences between human milk and uh, cow's milk. In the first place, the amount of carbohydrate in uh, human milk is much higher than in cow's milk. Secondly, the amount of protein in cow's milk is much higher than that of breast milk. And finally, the amount of fat is um, is similar. However, there are certain differences in the fat composition. When you look at saturated fats, there is much higher quantity of saturated fats in cow's milk, much lower monounsaturated, and very little polyunsaturated fats. And that's why it is recommended that babies who are not breastfed be not fed cow's milk formula, uh, cow's milk, sorry, but cow's milk formula. Now, different species have different protein concentrations. And we can see here that the human milk has the lowest protein concentration of all other species. The amount of cow's milk protein, uh, protein in cow's milk is almost twice as that in human milk. In rabbit is, is uh, 12 times that of human milk. In dog is about 10 times, sheep, etc. And camel, again, for uh, countries that have camels, it is uh, similar to that of cow's milk. As you may know, in the Middle East, they make chocolate out of camel's milk, and they also uh, feed some uh, children with cow's milk. But as I mentioned before, 
this is uh, the main striking differences in protein concentration in human versus cow versus rabbit milk. And if by any chance a baby is fed uh, rabbit milk, this is what may happen. What is the experience of feeding a higher protein formula with a lower protein formula? This is compared to breastfed infants. So here we look at the weight for length along the first 21 months of age. And we can see that in formulas with high protein, the weight for age remains significantly higher than in that who have been breastfed. So breastfed infants have a lower weight for length, particularly after the first six months of life. And that's different, remains significant with babies who have been fed a high protein formula. And when I'm being high means what you normally uh, find in most of the formulas that are available in the market, except for some. This is an impact of incidence of obesity at five or six years, according to what they uh, were fed in the first few months of life. If they have never been breastfed, the chances of being overweight are 12.6%. The chances of being overweight if you have ever been breastfed is 9.2. So there's a significant difference in the protection that ever being breastfed gives for the risk of overweight and at a lower level also for obesity. So not all infant formulas are the same and some have lower protein content and that will, uh, it's shown to decrease the BMI at six years of age. So the lower protein content and not all formulas are the same, the same that not all cows are the same. They're similar, but not the same. So now again, uh, as we're gonna to move to complementary feedings, we're gonna talk about Pudding Lane that is in London, another street that I found there, which I find it quite interesting. So complementary feeding is the process that starts when breast milk alone is no longer sufficient to meet the nutritional requirements in infants and therefore other foods and liquids are needed along with breast milk. It typically covers the period from six to 24 months of age, even though breastfeeding may continue up to two years of age and beyond. The introduction of complementary feeding is a critical period of growth during which nutrient deficiencies and illness contribute globally to higher rates of undernutrition among children under five years of age. It is recommended by the, Europe, by the WHO, as I said, six months of exclusive breastfeeding, but the European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition, considering that many women work and cannot exclusively breastfeed for six months, have considered that at least exclusive breastfeeding should last for four months, and then exclusive or predominant breastfeeding to continue for six months, which is desirable. Complementary food should not be started before four months of age, but should not be delayed beyond six months of age. Breastfeeding should continue as complementary foods are introduced, as I said, and whole cow's milk should not be used in an infant main drink before 12 months of age. But in addition to nutrition, the introduction of complementary feeding is a major proactive step in infants towards growing up. It requires a series of neurodevelopmental achievements and it becomes a way of socialization. So this is the document, a copy of the first page of the document uh, published by the ESCAN in 2017 regarding complementary feeding. This study uh, is, a, uh, is a recent study was published two years ago and shows the different growth patterns that persist at 24 months in uh, former uh, infants and for infants who were either breastfed, continue to receive after weaning uh, milk or meat. So they were fed for the first few months of life and then they were randomly assigned to receive either complementary diet from five to 12 months, either the introduction of meats or can to continue with milk alone. And as you can see, the growth z-score at 5, 12, and 25 months uh, of age for participants who completed the 24 months assessment was in length for age, the baby who had weaning, had introduction of meats and other uh, meals as well, but meats had a high, with a higher length z-score than those who continued on milk. But even more importantly, when you look at the uh, weight for length, Z-score, 
the infants who were introduced to meat at five months of age, they had a leaner weight for length Z score than those who continue with milk alone. So therefore there is an impact on long-term, at least at 24 months of the introduction of complementary feedings other than milk at five, six months of age. Now, complementary feedings, and I talked about uh, the need of supplementation because there is a global burden of chronic and hidden hunger. And the hidden hunger, I have to say that a few years ago, I didn't know what it was. Uh, if these people here in India are eating, and I thought that this was hidden hunger, so the person who was hiding. But it turns out that no, hidden hunger is a much more complicated thing and leads to uh, this capacity in many, many countries. This is the deficiency that is not overt of certain vitamins and micronutrients such as vitamin A, vitamin D, zinc, but particularly iron. And as you can see, the improvement over years in the world of chronic hunger has decreased significantly, but that of hidden hunger, not so much. And hidden hunger, the discapacity adjusted for life, if you look at the different countries, it has improved, but not, it remains as a problem in many parts of the world. So this is something that can be prevented, at least initially, with uh, the appropriate complementary feeding. Let's talk about iron deficiency. Iron requirements exceed that of iron intake at two times in the life of a child, at six to 18 months of life, and then for girls during adolescence. Iron deficiency in the first year of life is fundamental because it's a period of rapid neural development when morphological, biochemical, and bioenergetic alterations may influence future functioning. Structures of the brain can become abnormal because of iron deficiency either intrauterine or in early postnatal life. Iron is essential for proper neurogenesis and differentiation of certain brain cells and regions. And why does iron deficiency occur? Well, as you can see here, the, the, the storage, tissue, and hemoglobin at birth, there is an equal, as a good distribution. But at four months of age, a breast, exclusively breastfed infant has received little iron and therefore their storage decreases. And when this baby starts growing rapidly, then there's not gonna be enough iron to keep, uh, to keep the storage appropriately. So that's why iron supplementation need to be started to prevent future iron deficiencies. When we look at the brain and we look at the hippocampus, the hippocampus is the area of the brain that is in, uh, plays a vital role in regulating learning, memory encoding, memory consolidation, and spatial navigation. And this uh, area therefore is very dependent on iron for its development. When you look at the hippocampus in the brain, it's called like that because it's similar to the hippocampus in the ocean. And that should not be confused with hippopotamus, which is a totally different kind of animal. So iron deficiency in infancy is associated with altered neural correlates of recognition memory at, at, at 10 years of age. These are a series of studies that have been done in the country of Chile by a group of investigators of Chile and United States. And what they did is they followed for many, many years, for 25 years, children who had been anemic in the, neo, in, in the first year of life and compare them to those who had not been anemic. He, they put a, a lot of electrodes in the heads of these children at, uh, when they were older. And what they told that they gave them new words that they had never heard before, or they spoke to them old words that they, rec that they were supposed to recognize rapidly. And you can see that the, these are the controls who had never had iron deficiency. And these are the patients, the individuals who had had iron deficiency anemia, but had been corrected uh, early in life. So despite of the correction of the iron deficiency, you can see differences in color. And this is the time um, that it takes for the infants to recognize, or the children to recognize the words. If there's very little lag here if they had never been iron deficient, but you can see the difference in the curves if they had been ever iron deficient. 
So even cor correction of iron deficiency might leave long-term sequelae. So one should prevent iron deficiency. So at 25 years of age, these investigators, that is, when they saw individuals who were now 25 but had been anemic as young children, and there was a higher proportion of the following on patients who had been chronically iron deficient, did not complete secondary school, they were not pursuing further educational training, they were single, which perhaps could be a benefit, but that's, I don't know, that's a different story, and reported poor emotional health and more negative emotions and feelings of dissociation detachment. Therefore, uh, this is corrected for many other uh, factors. So it, it is possible that iron deficiency might have a very long-term impact, even in socialization and capacity and learning. So what are the ways to prevent iron deficiency? Well, one of the ways is to give babies meat. And this study compared the providing meat in children. This was before the recommendation. So you see this study is from 98. So they gave meat to three to 10 months old who were partially breastfed or formula fed and looked at the prevention of fall of hemoglobin at the end of the first year of life. And that did happen. However, compared to iron supplementation, the iron storage or cellular iron was not impacted. So the giving of meat prevents iron deficiency but not, does not increase iron storage. In different countries, they use different meats. In Italy, they, love, uh, they give babies uh, rabbit and horse, uh, just uh, out of curiosity. But it is very uh, known that uh, iron-45 infant cereal is preventative of iron deficiency, and this is uh, well documented. The iron to supplement uh, cereal for babies has been modified so it doesn't have a bad taste. It does not produce gastrointestinal symptoms like uh, ferrous sulfate. And compared to iron fortified rice cereal to unfortified rice cereal in infants who were exclusively breastfed for more than four months, and to iron fortified infant formula in infants who were uh, also older, the design was a double blind. This is a study done in Chile in respect to presence or absence of fortification iron in the cereal or formula and included 515 infants who were followed on the protocol for four to 15 months of age. And what they showed is that iron 45 infant cereal can contribute substantially to preventing iron deficiency. So this is a study, Sweden and uh, other countries. Now let's talk now about the timing of introduction of complementary feedings. Why did we say that it should not be before four months and not after six months of age? The study shows the effects of early nutritional interventions on the development of atopic disease in infants, the role of maternal diet restriction, breastfeeding, time of introduction, and complementary hydrolyzed formulas. Well, here we, and this is in conjunction with the paper that I already uh, show you, complementary feedings. I think that it's very important to uh, um, show this that allergenic foods may be introduced whenever complementary feedings are commenced at any time after four months. So there is no restriction of the introduction of uh, potentially allergenic feedings because it does not prevent allergy. On the contrary, it might increase it. Infants at high risk of peanut allergy, those with severe eczema, egg allergy, or both with a family history, should have peanut introduced between four and 11 months following evaluation by an appropriately trained specialist. Very early introduction of solid foods and a high diversity before week 17 of age may increase the risk of later allergies. So it should not be done very early, but it should not be, be done very late either and should be in proportionate amounts. Now I have looked and found uh, this article from, uh, from 2011 about the epidemiology of celiac disease in Iran. And what it shows is that Iran has an incidence of one, a prevalence of one in 166, which is a little bit uh, lower than other countries, uh, many European countries, but uh, not many different than others. When this group uh, looked at the prevalence in the normal population is much lower, of course, but when we look at, um, short stature in children with short stature or with iron deficiency anemia, there is much higher grade of, uh, of celiac disease. So 
Therefore, one has to look at celiac disease as a potential cause for iron deficiency or short stature. But from our stand of point of view, again, it may be introduced, gluten may be introduced between four and 12 months of age. It is recommended to introduce gluten gradually while the child is still breastfed. And the extent that, is, that it can reduce this risk of celiac disease, diabetes mellitus type one and wheat allergy. So again, no delay in introduction of, of gluten. Now, if infants receive a vegetarian diet, I'm not sure how popular that is in Iran, but they should be uh, receiving a sufficient amount of breast milk or formula and infants and young children should not be fed a vegan diet. Now, many parents want to introduce a sleep because, uh, so that the child can sleep. And one, as a physician, doesn't know very well if this is true or not. And this is a study that was done in which they uh, randomly assigned babies to early, this was published in 2018. This was a study that was assigned to either early introduction of cereal or later, and then they looked at the pattern of sleep. And when you look at the nine times sleeping hours versus early versus late introduction of complementary foods, you can see that indeed when the mean night line, nighttime sleep time in hours was much greater from quite early on in early introduction group versus the standard introduction group. So it does really help. And when you look at the number of times that the babies wake up during the night, if they had had early introduction of group is much lower than those who had not received uh, complementary feedings from early life. So indeed, it shows that there is a relationship between introduction of complementary feedings and better sleep patterns. How about the infant nutrition relationship to eating behavior and fruit and vegetable intake at five years of age? This is a study that explores whether solid foods are associated with children's eating behavior and fruit and vegetable intake later on at five years of age. This is a study from the Netherlands where they compared exclusive breastfeeding duration was not associated with later eating behavior, although longer exclusive breastfeeding was significantly associated with a higher vegetable intake at five years of age. Why this association is not clear, this is just an observational study but uh, that's what it showed. Compare with the introduction of solid foods at six months of age, introduction up below four months of age was associated with less feeling of satiety at five years. So it could be that appetite regulation is improved by delaying the introduction of complementary food, uh, feedings at around six months of age and not definitely below four months for many reasons. Introduction of solid foods beyond six months of age was associated with less enjoyment of food and food responsiveness. So that's another justification for this frame period I said, four to six months. These findings suggest that prolonged breastfeeding and introduction of solid foods between four and six months may lead to healthier eating behavior and food preferences at five years of age. So there are a lot of studies that have looked into these things. Uh, data from infants and young children, six to 23 months of age across country demonstrated a positive association between dietary variety and nutritional status. Early exposure to fruits and vegetables in infancy associated with better acceptance of these foods at later ages. Both the caregiver and behaviors as well as the child's temperament influence the feeding relationship. A parent who allows the infant to determine the timing the amount and pacing of a meal helps the infant develop self-regulation and secure attachment. When the child's signals are misinterpreted, it can lead to or aggravate further problematic feeding behaviors. The issue of sugar is a major concern. The WHO has strict regulations about sugar. It is increasing concern that the intake of free sugars, particularly in the form of sugar-sweetened beverages, increases overall energy intake reduce the intake of healthy foods, particularly proteins and vitamins and minerals. So these drinks now have become very popular and they are mainly carbohydrate and could be used uh, you know, as a distraction, but not as a main feeding. Introduction of inappropriate complementary feeding in the first year of life associated with uh, low socioeconomic status. This is a study from Brazil in which they saw that uh, the prevalence of introduction of early sugar 
and cookies, crackers, creamy yogurt was much greater if the families were uh, poor than if they were not. So uh, instead of using uh, sugar, natural sweeteners for baby food are recommended. Any fresh fruit can be added to baby food to make it more naturally sweet. Similar recommendations for salt, daily infant salt required is rather, rather low. And this mostly can be met by breast milk or infant formula. There's no need to add salt to the complementary feedings. And anything else would be a burden for the, kid, for the kidneys. So what should we tolerate? There are different feeding patterns in children. Sometimes uh, some of them are appropriate, sometimes some are fun. This is probably not a good recommendation for early introduction of complementary feedings. And this is something that is not a good uh, substitute of breast milk. With that, and from a picture of downtown Buenos Aires, I want to thank you for your invitation once again and i hope that everybody remains uh, healthy and we can see each other in face to face in the very near future thank you very much so thanks again professor lipschitz it was so informative and first i gotta make an announcement to our participants and especially dear professors and vulnerable lecturers i should clarify the point which made big misunderstanding and inconvenience the state i mentioned as a sponsorship point completely were related to an internal state and completely and definitely separated from the panel and lecturers we state and imply that all lecturers had no conflict of interest and there is no sponsorship Made. The company we announced completely uh, was an internal company with the same name and the sponsorship was from Farsi part of the Congress, which mentioned in, uh, unintentionally mistaken. We are deeply sorry for this mistake and any inconvenience and bothering followed. So here we have some questions for Professor Lipschitz in the chat section. Uh, Professor Lipschitz, if you are with us uh, and ready, I will read the questions. I am. Let me find the question. Uh, is the protein structure efficient as its molecular weights? I am not sure what the question relates to. If the protein is of lower molecular weight, it's called hydrolyzed protein and it's either partially hydrolyzed or uh, extensively hydrolyzed. Those are proteins, the extensively hydrolyzed protein is a protein that it's used for treatment of cow's milk allergy. The indication for partially hydrolyzed, uh, it depends. There are some studies that have shown that in high risk families, it is preventative of development of allergic symptoms. And this is something that has been carried out in a study in several studies in Germany in a very large group. On the other hand, a partially hydrolyzed formula could be useful perhaps in children with some functional GI disorders, although none of the societies approve this uh, recommendation. However, the physicians uh, use it and in discussions they find it sometimes useful. I don't hear you. Sorry, sorry, my bad. So sorry. We have another question. Isn't four months very early for food introduction? We have a problem when you introduce early supplementary food, the baby will decrease weight uh, due not you know, having the breast milk introduction. Well, of course, the recommendations of the WHO are that the baby be fully breastfed until six months of age and only complementary feedings introduced later. And again, all these comments are for healthy, growing well babies, not for prematures, not for, there's very few data on prematures. The problem is that today, uh, many mothers work out of their homes and they cannot uh, provide breast milk exclusively. So, introduction of formula, which by WHO standards, formula is called complementary feeding. So if one 
can delay the introduction of complementary feeding until six months, that's ideal. But in some situations, it has to be done earlier. And what the European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition recommends is that definitely should not be done under four months of age and also not beyond six months of age. Thank you, thank you so much. And dear Professor Gagari wrote in the chat section, do you think very soon we will ask mothers to introduce complementary early supporting exposure rather than avoidance? Well, that's a very good question and depends uh, what it is. It, there is no doubt that for example, in families with celiac disease, introduction of gluten is recommended in very small amounts while the baby continues to be breastfed. Uh, with allergenic foods, uh, only if there is a question of peanut allergy that it should be very, more, um, very closely monitored, but otherwise there is no restriction neither to the breastfeeding mother nor to the baby. So possibly I would say that the, at this point what we know is that caution should be used in introduction of gluten to uh, families where celiac disease is prevalent. Thank you, thank you so much again. I, uh, Professor Aray would have a word with you. Um, there was, uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, there was a problem uh, from our side and uh, it was uh, unintentionally uh, one of my colleagues from the Persian uh, side of the conference uh, 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 really told uh, my colleague to announce one company as an sponsor. Uh, it was a great mistake from our side, and uh, this company does not um, does not support this session or any of our presentations. Uh, I would like to uh, apologize from uh, each one of our. Uh, attendees and uh, audiences and also uh, our uh, dear professors that have their presentations here. Uh, we are so sorry and uh, we shall correct this mistake uh, from our side. And uh, if there is any inconvenience, uh, I shall apologize. And I would like uh, to ask you to accept our apologies from our side. I understand uh, your uh, uh, your words, and uh, that's all. Uh, just um, take, uh, I would like to, I wish you can take our apologies and uh, so sorry about that. If I may say something that although- Of course, well, this, of this course, was sir. An unintentional error, there is nothing that the speaker said that could be even remotely associated to anything of industry. So even if something went as it shouldn't, there is absolutely no connection between the topics and any industry in the world actually. So I think that the, you apologized enough, the apologies are well taken and uh, you, you're doing an outstanding job this, in, continue, in considering the circumstances and that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Khalaf, I should, th I should apologize uh, personally to you and uh, I can understand uh, you're a very good friend of mine and uh, I'm so sorry about that. No, it's okay. I was just uh, just want to uh, to let the people know that we are not uh, sponsored by any companies, and we of don't course. like that. Of course, of course, don't support that. And of uh, course, this is uh, something which is uh, ethical, and we have a lot of. I know. Uh, I know. Uh, seniors and teachers and students, they watch us. They follow us. So we should Surely. be very, very careful when we are talking uh, about advertisements for mentioning name of companies. This is a very, very sens sensitive subject for me. Um, I understand that it was, uh, it happened by mistake and it's okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Carlos, uh, Dr. Lipschitz, uh, it was very nice. Dr. Khalaf, very uh, I should thank you again for your uh, acceptance of the apologies. So let's uh, continue. So uh, next we will have Professor Misak to tell us about the functional gastrointestinal disorders. And uh, unfortunately she was in a busy place. So we asked her to play the pre-recorded version. We have her in a few seconds.
Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a great honor and a pleasure to give a presentation on this meeting. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to give the presentation on functional gastrointestinal disorders. According to Rome 4 criteria, we can diagnose functional gastrointestinal disorders. And today we will talk about what are the functional gastrointestinal disorders, how to diagnose them, how and why to treat them. According to ground four criteria, functional gastrointestinal disorders in children and adolescents can be divided into three main groups, functional nausea and vomiting disorders, functional abdominal pain disorders, and functional defecation disorders. Unfortunately, we do not have enough time to go through each one of them, but I will try to give you an overview. And we will start first with functional abdominal pain disorders. We know that even more than 35% of elementary school children report abdominal pain at least weekly, although one third of them meet wrong criteria for diagnosis of some of functional gastrointestinal disorders, but they are very common. The etiology of functional gastrointestinal disorders is not completely understood, but it is meant to be multifactorial and brain gut axis and its bidirectional communication plays a major role. The disarrangement in this brain gut axis communication leads to functional abdominal pain. On one hand, we have early life events and psychological factors. And on the other hand, we have genetic predisposition, gastrointestinal infections, altered gut microbiota, and abnormal motility. The the arrangement and its function in this brain gut axis leads to functional abdominal pain. What is going on? Pain episodes can be affected by psychosocial stressors on one hand and alter GI physiology on the other hand. And how the child copes with the pain episodes, it determines the episode outcome. If the child copes well and accommodates to to pain, then we have normal development with no disability. But if we have the maladaptive disorder response, then it will end with chronic pain and disability. How do we diagnose functional gastrointestinal disorders? We should take a detailed history, exclude alarm symptoms, and take a detailed physical exam and try to give the positive diagnosis. The diagnosis should not be negative, not after we exclude everything. And the parents and child should leave doctor's office with a working diagnosis of functional abdominal pain. What we have shown is that uh, the diagnosis of functional disorder from the beginning, from the first visit at the doctor's office, improves the pain symptoms. And even ROM4 criteria says that after appropriate evaluation, if the symptoms cannot be fully explained by another medical condition, the diagnosis can be given. And it permits that selective or no testing is needed to support positive diagnosis of functional gastrointestinal disorder. But we have to be aware of potential alarm features in children with chronic abdominal pain. And these alarm features are positive family history and inflama of inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, or peptic ulcer disease, persistent right upper or right lower quadrant pain, dysphagia, odinophagia, persistent vomiting, gastrointestinal blood loss, nocturnal diarrhea, arthritis, perirectal disease, involuntary weight loss, deceleration of linear growth, delayed puberty, or unexplained fever. The more alarm symptoms we have, it is the more likely to have the organic disease underlying. So what are the diagnostic criteria uh, of irritable bowel syndrome? If the criteria are fulfilled for at least two months before the diagnosis and includes all the following, then we can uh, diagnose irritable bowel syndrome. And the criteria are abdominal pain at least four days per month associated with one or the more of 
or the, of the following related to defecation, a change in the frequency of stool, a change in form of stool, and in children with constipation, the pain does not resolve with the resolution of the constipation. And after appropriate evaluation, the symptoms cannot be fully explained by another medical condition. If these are fulfilled, then we can diagnose irritable bowel syndrome. What about functional abdominal pain uh, not otherwise specified? criteria have to be fulfilled for at least two months before the diagnosis and at least four times per month and include all of the following. Episodic or continuous abdominal pain that does not occur solely during physiological events, insufficient criteria for IBS, functional dyspepsia or abdominal migraine, and after appropriate evaluation, the abdominal pain cannot be fully explained by another medical condition. If we have alarm features, then we should do some additional diagnostic testing. But although if we don't have uh, any of uh, alarm symptoms, often for re parental reassurance, diagnostic workup is performed. And here is the one study that showed how many tests were performed in children with functional abdominal pain, and most of the results came normal. But look at the cost. They were enormous. So the question was said, is it worth it? So if we don't have organic disease underlying, why do we treat these disorders? Because episodes are very frequent, quality of life is decreased, and there is a high school absenteeism. It was shown that children with functional abdominal pain and inflammatory bowel disease miss significantly more school days than their uh, healthy controls. It is surprising that children with functional abdominal pain miss, significant, uh, miss uh, similar days of school like the children who have IBD, chronic, Crohn's disease of ulcerative colitis. So what do we use in treatment? We can use pharmacological treatment or non-pharmacological treatment. For As pharmacological treatment, antispasmodics, antidepressants, antihistaminic, and laxatives have been used, but there are no high-quality placebo-controlled trials of pharmacological treatment, and there are no evidence to support routine use of any of pharmacological therapy for abdominal pain associated functional gastrointestinal disorders. What are the non pharmacological options? Diet modification have been studied, but it was not significant for lactose free diet. One randomized controlled trial on a small number of children studied the influence of low FODMAP diet in children with IBS and it showed improvement. As we already said that uh, functional abdominal pain is a brain uh, gut axis disorder. Hypnotherapy and cognitive behavior therapy have been studied, and it was shown that it is more effective than standard treatment. However, it is not widely available. What are the other options? Uh, probiotics have been studied in several uh, studies, and mostly in IBS and functional abdominal pain. And strains that were studied are LGG for IBS and lactobacillus reuteri for functional abdominal pain. And it was shown for functional abdominal pain that lactobacillus reuteri, shown in the yellow color, uh, significantly reduces pain intensity. And also the frequency of pain was reduced. It was also confirmed in the meta-analysis and that the pain intensive intensity, although, although weakly, was reduced. It was also shown that children who received lactobacillus reuteri had more pain-free days than those children who received placebo. But it has to be mentioned that children who received placebo had also some chance uh, to to have uh, the improvement after receiving uh, the trial of placebo. And for irritable bowel syndrome, mostly uh, LGG strain was uh, tested. And it was shown that uh, the use of LGG in IBS had uh, some improvement in uh, symptoms of IBS. So, 
the algorithm of treating functional abdominal pain and IBS was suggested. And according to that, first step would be to re reassure and educate the patient and the parents. But if there is no improvement, the therapy could be considered. It can be pharmacological therapy or non-pharmacological therapy. If uh, co cognitive behavioral therapy, hypnotherapy are uh, available, they can be considered. Uh, if not, probiotics can be considered. And uh, for that, we have to have keep in mind that not all probiotics are the same. And lactobacillus reuteri has an effect in functional abdominal pain, while LGG has an effect in IBS. Other probiotics have not been studied or uh, the efficacy, efficacy was not proved. So only strains proven for specific clinical condition or indication should be recommended and used. The next group of gastrointestinal disorders are functional nausea and vomiting disorders. Cyclic vomiting syndrome is a syndrome of recurrent episodes of intense nausea and vomiting that can last from hours to days without any functional or infectious illness. Its prevalence is up to 1% and it can occur at any age from infancy to adulthood, but median age of symptom onset is from three to seven years of age. The diagnostic criteria must include all of the following. The occurrence of two or more periods of intense unremitting nausea and paroxysmal vomiting lasting hours to days within a six month period. Episodes are stereotypical in each patient. Episodes are separated by weeks to months with return to baseline health between episodes. And after appropriate medical evaluation, the symptoms cannot be attributed to another condition. If we have early onset of symptoms, higher likelihood of under metabolic diseases is there and we should do metabolic testing. It is suggested to do it during the vomiting episode and before administration of intravenous fluids just to maximize detection of abnormalities. Here is the cycle of cycling vomiting syndrome. Between the episodes in interepisodic phase, the patient is free of symptoms and prophylactic therapy can be used to prevent attacks or decrease their number. And propranolol, ciproheptadine, pisotifan, and amitriptyline can be used. In prodromal phase, when there is extreme nausea, abdominal pain, lethargy, pallor, and anorexia that can last minutes to hours, the abortive therapies can be used. And these are antiemetics, anti-migraine agent sedatives, just to prevent an incipient vomiting attack. During the vomiting episode, uh, the rescue therapy is applied. Antiemetics, sedatives to stop the vomiting cycle, and uh, IV fluid therapy for hydration and correction of metabolic acidosis and electric Im electrolyte imbalance. In the recovery phase, patient is often fatigued and IV fluids can be administered. Aerophagia is another, uh, another disorder of functional nausea and vomiting disorders group. It is an excessive and repetitive air swallowing. And what happens is uh, that with excessive air swallowing, gas fills the GI lumen and there is excessive belching, abdominal distension, flightless pain because of luminal distension. Sometimes it is triggered by the exposure to stressful events and anxiety, and in order children because of excessive chewing gum and drinking very quickly. For uh, aerophagia, diagnostic criteria must be fulfilled for at least two months before the diagnosis. And they must include all of the following, excessive air swallowing, abdominal distension due to intraluminal air, which increases during the day, repetitive belching, and currently increased flatus. And after appropriate evaluation, the symptoms cannot be fully explained by another medical condition. There are no controlled studies in, uh, uh, on treatment in children, and the treatment is usually supportive, behavioral therapy, psychotherapy, and benzodiazepines. And the last group is functional defecation disorder. Functional constipation has a mean prevalence of 14%, with a peak incidence at the time of toilet training. And we can... Uh, 
put the diagnosis if we have the criteria that includes two or more of the following occurring at least once per week for a minimum of one month with insufficient criteria for diagnosis of IBS. So if we have two or fewer defecation in the toilet per week in a child of a development age of at least four years, at least one episode of fecal incontinence per week, history of retentive posturing or excessive stool retention, history of painful or hard bowel movements, or presence of a large fecal mass in the rectum, history of large diameter stools that can obstruct the toilet, we can give the uh, uh, we can give the diagnosis of functional constipation what is underlying the child has instinct to avoid defecation because of pain or social reasons and that leads to voluntary withholding of stools that leads to colonic mucosa absorbs water from the feces and the retained stools becomes progressively harder and evacuation becomes more difficult and then the instinct to avoid defecation is uh, more pronounced. On the other hand, rectum is increasingly distended and we have overflow, fecal incontinence and loss of rectal sensation that leads to the loss of normal urge to defecate and also decreased motility in the foregut that leads to anorexia, abdominal distension and pain. In diagnosing functional constipation, we should be aware of potential alarm features. And if we have those features, we should do some more testing. So the alarm features are, if the passage of the meconium is after 48 hours in two newborn, if there is a constipation starting in the first month of life, if there is a family history of Hirschsprung's disease, if there are ribbon stools, if there is a blood in the stools in the absence of anal fissures, if there is a failure to thrive, bilious vomiting, severe abdominal distension, abnormal thyroid gland, abnormal position of the anus, absent anal or chromasteric reflux, decreased lower extremity strength, tone or reflexes, sacral dimple, tuft of hair and spine or gluteal cleft deviation or anal scars, we should do some more testing. What about the treatment? First step is education. The families should be counseled to recognize withholding behaviors and to use behavioral intervention. And regular toileting, use the diaries to track the stooling, reward system for successful evacuation. And the next step is pharmacological approach. That is divided into two steps. First one is rectal or oral disinfection, and the second one is maintenance therapy to prevent reaccumulation. We use laxatives for pharmacological approach, high doses for disinfection, plus continued four months for maintenance. Polyethylene glycol is the first line therapy for constipated children, and it is more effective than other laxatives for disinfection and for maintenance. And to conclude, we know today the disorders of uh, functional gastrointestinal disorders are uh, disorders of the gut brain interaction. And we should give the positive diagnosis, but we should be aware of alarm symptoms. And if we have the alarm symptoms, we should do some more testing. Thank you for your attention. Thanks again, Professor Misak. Let's see if there are any questions in the chat section. Uh, I believe there are not. So from each and every one of us here at Children's Medical Center, Tehran University of Medical Sciences, we would like to say a particular thank you to Professor Vasilios Fanos, Professor Carlos Lifshitz, Professor Khalaf Gergeri, and Professor Misak, whose support we, uh, we are honored to have. And despite the time difference, we were more than happy to get involved. A special thank you also goes to our fantastic audience. Again, I want, to uh, I want to review this with you guys. If you want to receive a certificate of attendance in this Congress, make sure to register on our website and reserve a seat on your desired panel. For our Iranian audience, if you want to receive CME credits, don't forget to participate in the panel quiz in maximum of two days on cmequiz.ir. Don't forget to allow, uh, follow our social media pages and YouTube channel to stay updated on our next events. 
Unless there are any other questions, I want to thank everyone who has participated on today's call. Thank you for all for your patience. For our next event, our upcoming virtual conference, the allergy session will take place here in this hall. We look forward to seeing you at this meeting and we're sure <clears throat> you'll find it an outstanding educational opportunity. Again, thank you everyone for your patience. We're, we appreciate your continued cooperation with us. Please submit your questions to us on our social media. If you have anything that uh, you thought of after we conclude today's session, we will make sure to answer those questions. Thank you everyone, have a good afternoon.